in our part of the world. And second, they need a special uh, care and sometimes the special implants as well. Uh, Dr. Anil Arula is the convener for uh, today's webinar um, and uh, the uh, well-known faculty who will be introduced by Dr. Anil Arula. Uh, Dr. Anil, uh, over to you, please. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Thank you, IEA, and thank you, IUA, for this uh, for asking me to convene this webinar. I quickly rush to my slides because we have three faculty who are waiting to board the flight. So, put on slideshow. Yeah, visible, Dr. Rajiv. It's visible. Yes. Yeah, uh, welcome yes. you all. Welcome you all, and uh, thanks, uh, IU officials, to participate in this webinar. I, I think uh, they are also Dr. Chadda is also traveling. I'm just going to introduce uh, our faculty quickly in alphabetical order. Dr. Ajit, our current president of Indian Arthroplasty Association, blessed to have him with us today. He's from Mangalore. Myself, I am from Delhi. And uh, Padamshi, Dr. Ashok Rajgopal, who can join us any minute, I had a word with him. He's group chairman. He's from Medanta Medicity, Delhi, NCR. There's a lot of awards, more than 35,000 knee arthroplasty. Dr. Padi is with us. He's going to organize next IAA conference at Bhubaneswar. I'll just rush through Krishna Kiran, a dynamic young genius arthroplasty surgeon from Hyderabad. Dr. Manuj, Virat Kohli and uh, Sachin Tendulkar combined of Indian Arthroplasty Association. A lot of awards with him. A lot of centuries, a lot of thousands of joints he had done. Dr. Minal Sharma, author of two books. He has written two books on knee, knee arthroplasty, hip arthroplasty. He's from Bridabad. Dr. Chandrasekhar, an arthroplasty surgeon from Bengaluru. Dr. Kalia from Rishikesh. He's, he's heading on an institute of medical science at Rishikesh. And Dr. Rajiv, who is holding Indian arthroplasty chair of Indian Arth Orthopedic Association. He has been past president of IAA, quite active. And he bears the flag of academics of IAA in various organizations. Dr. Rajkumar Natteson, our current secretary of IAA from Coimbatore. I hope he has joined. Dr. Mesh Mahajan from Nagpur. He runs his own center. And Dr. Vikash Kapoor from Kolkata. So we are all, we are very thankful for the faculty for sparing time. I'll be just giving a quick introduction of valgus knee, how it is different from varus knee. Shall I get going, Dr. Rajiv? Yes, yes, please go. Okay, thank you very much. So friends, uh, lateral release in totally arthroplasty for valgus knee is a bit complex because there are a lot of structures on the lateral side which are taught in different positions of the knee. And this release is sometimes unpredictable in long run as far as longevity of implant is concerned. So iliotibial band and postlateral capsule are responsible for contracture of the knee in extension, while lateral collateral ligament and popliteus in flexion as well as extension. And popliteal fibular ligament is taught, it keeps the taut, knee taut in flexion. There can be contracture of muscles in severe cases of biceps femoris and lateral head of gastronomius. There could be tight lateral retinaculum, putting the patella laterally subluxed or even dislocated. The structure on the medial side are lax, including medial collateral ligament. And not only soft tissue, but there are bony abnormalities, which is different from varus knees. The lateral femoral condyle could be hypoplastic. And if you use posterior condylar axis for femoral rotation, you will throw your femoral component in internal rotation. So one has to be very careful. Besides this, there could be valgus external rotation remodeling of the distal femur and proximal tibia. There will be unusual neck shaft angle and there could be tibial bone defect, which is largely contained in these cases, unlike varus knees. There can be diaphyseal bowing, valgus tibia valga, there could be stress reaction in the lateral part, lower part of the fibula, or they can have a frank stress fracture. Many of these patients, especially rheumatoids, they have hind foot and forefoot deformities. And the valgus knee 
could be in hyperextension or like in RA infection. Of all the classifications, majority of surgeons follow Ranavas classification, which is quite simple, into three grades. Grade one, less than 10 degree valgus deformity, most common deformity. It is correctable and the MCL is intact, largely intact. Grade two, deformity, tibiofemoral angle between 10 and 20 degrees. MCL is elongated but functional. It could be rigid. And grade three is more than 20 degree of deformities and incompetent MCL. Then Mulaji and Shetty, they further modified this classification and included hyperextension and flexion deformities as well as extra articular deformity into this classification. Now, while balancing the soft tissue in valgus knee, one has to balance between deformity correction, release, overzealous release, and long-term stability, which is going to affect longevity of total knee arthroplasty. As Dr. Rajiv pointed out, that they are quite complex. The extensive release advised earlier in 80s led to very high rate of late onset iatrogenic instability and white sides cautioned against popliteus tendon that one need not to release it inadvertently. It should be released only in case of extreme tightness because it's a dynamic flexion stabilizer. Sliding osteotomy introduced in 2002 and then pie crusting technique in 2004 and the most commonly used less extensive inside out technique of Ranavat in 2005. Dr. Manush Vada will show us some videos on this. And then Bulaj introduced navigation for lateral femoral epicondylar osteotomy. White sites releases advise long back usually are not followed nowadays. He advised releasing if, if the flexion is tight, releasing lateral collateral ligament and popliteus. If extension is tight, releasing iliotibial band and posterior capsule. But if there is overall tightness in flexion as well as extension, then releasing all four structures. This usually leads to late onset instability. The most commonly used technique is that of Ranavat. Majority of surgeons follow it, in which you cut the distal femur and proximal tibia. You balance the extension gap by soft tissue release, and then you balance the flexion gap by adjusting femoral cuts. So in extension balancing, you remove peripheral osteophytes, extend the knee, and then palpate tight structures. You release PCL, and then you release postulateral capsule at the level of tibia, preserve popliteus, do pie crusting of iliotibial band, and majority of time you are able to balance the knee in extension. For flexion gap balancing, the LCL is not released in these cases. And this is one, I'll just skip these diagrams. This is iliotibial band, pie crusting, and there's the popliteus, and there's the postlateral capsule. Dr. Manoj will show them. For flexion balancing, you place the block parallel to the tibial cut, and you raise or lower it to, to achieve a symmetric flexion extension gap. And it's mainly by bony cuts rather than soft tissue releases. And if you're not following this method, one can, for femoral rotation, follow white side line, perpendicular to the white side line or parallel to interapicondylar axis. And if the lateral tissue is tight, one can do pie crusting in the post-lateral corner. For, you can use CR knee or a PS knee. Danabat advocated using a PS knee, citing its own advantages. One can lateralize it, and PCL is usually tight. These are severe deformities. This was post-traumatic knee with a, with a lax MCL. A BBC uh, implant was used. One, can use, one, one needs to have CCK or hinged implant if there is severe ligamentous instability or there is hyperlaxity. To summarize, there is not enough evidence, which is the best, techniques, best technique for lateral soft tissue release, but majority of surgeons, they follow Ranavat's method. Pie crusting is better than complete release. At all costs, one should avoid complete release of popliteus. It, it gives rise to late instability. Be prepared with one level hair constraint. And complication rates in valgus knee as compared to varus knee are slightly higher. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Dr. Anil. That's a 
very good introduction to the subject, which we all agree that we say is not a, a, a subject which is easy to follow. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Manoj Vadhwa will show his uh, uh, further expertise of uh, how to do a right kind of the soft tissue release. And uh, for Dr. Ma I'll invite Dr. Manoj to speak on his uh, topic of balancing the valgus knee uh, and a soft tissue release. Uh, Manoj, thanks, over Rajiv. to you, please. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Rajiv. Thanks, Anil, for giving me the platform today. And uh, valgus knee is not the mirror image of the various knee. Rajiv, can you play the video, please? Yeah, sure. Yeah, valgus knee has a bony deformity, Dr. Anil has said, as well as soft tissue losses, mainly pertaining to the distal and posterior femoral condyle and the tibial plateau. Now, in this case, I'll not be talking about the uh, epicondyloshortening, just pertaining to soft tissue release in different case situations. This is a typical Ranavat grade 3, as you see, a stretchable deformity. My workhorse is the midline incision. Once you've gone through, you in uh, subluxed or uh, dislocated patella cases, only close cases, I use a lateral approach. Otherwise, my workhorse is the medial parapetal approach. But the difference is you only release up to the mid cornal plane of the divya. My first step always is to use a cruciate retaining knee for majority of the cases. I'll show you both platforms today. If you are using a non-navigated system, because for a release, you do not need a navigation across the I'm sending the parameters. You medialize the entry portal. You always have a defect onto the lateral side. As you see out here, the lateral femoral condyle will be hypoplastic as compared to the medial, tibial, medial femoral condyle. You see 9 mm of the medial as well as 4 L of the lateral condyle. Here, the tibial rotation is extremely important. You take it up to the center of the ankle. You don't go to the second ray because foot is normally plano velgoid in these cases. As with Dr. Ranavat, it's a tightness in extension and you do a pie crisping of posterior capsule as well as the iliotibial band. Now, setting of femoral rotation is the key. You never go along with the posterior condyles alone because then you will make your femur cut in internal rotation. It is normally in the apicondylar axis or perpendicular white sides line. You see your stability across both in flexion and extension. If your knee is stable in flexion as well as extension, you are already through with it. Otherwise, you have to move back in, identify the tight bands on the lateral side and do a pike resting. Now you see your stability getting on in full extension, mid flexion as well as the full extension. At all stages, your knee has to be stable in flexion and extension, and the petla has to fall into the sulcus, a good pelar tracking, as you see in all these skyline views with just a CR knee. Talking a bit on a close-up view of the pike resting, we release the posterior capsule, and then try to identify the tight area spreading the laminar spreader. If you still have a lexically developing medial lead, you go back in and again identify the tight structures left in, use a number 11 bleed or a 18 gauge needle. Release the tight areas till your gaps become equal and squarish in both flexion and extension. This is a rigid valgus knee. As you see out here, a lot of deformities with flexion, contractures developed up. So these are the cases in which you have a contracture of the hamstrings also, as well as the lateral subluxing patella. As you see out here, it goes more than 40 to 50 degrees on the lateral side. The same way, the midline inseam, medial parapetal approach, only release up to the mid corneal plane, wreck the osteophytes, sublux the patella laterally, take out the loose bodies, a lot of hypertrophic osteophytes are there around the lateral ridge. You take them off. Once you're through with it, release the PCL. So medialize the entry portal with a step period lift. Once you have done your resection of your distal femur, you will always get a hypoplastic distal femoral condyle. Release the patellofemoral ligament laterally. Again, with Dr. Anwar stream, parallel to the tibial cut, perpendicular to the white side line, and in access with the trans epicondyle axis. 
setting this temporal rotation right is extremely important because you don't want internal rotation of your temporal component in the middle of falling laterally. So this again is hyperplastic lateral temporal condyle. As you see out here, you have a trapezoidal gap. You go back and release the ligaments, the patellofemoral ligament, and do a pie cresting of the tight posterolateral structures. Take off the butting osteophytes on the lateral side. Check your space of blacks both in flexion and extension. It is still loose on the medial side. You move back in, do a pie crusting of the tight structures, which is very, very important to have an optimal release. Tilt your medial and lateral structures are there. Very rarely we move on to the uh, CCK or uh, higher amount of hinges as a constraint on epicondylar osteotomy, but they're always in a backup. Your knee is good in flexion extension, but the patella sublux laterally. My favorite part is the outside in approach, saving the synovium, but also at the same time trying to save the lateral superior and inferior janicular vessels. Once your patella starts falling into the sulcus and your release is optimal. Now it's a third phase where you have external inflation of the tibia still persisting, for which we do a IT band release. And once you've done an IT band release, you address to a rectangular flexion extension gaps, an optimal soft tissue release, your patella falling into the sulcus and external tissue of the tibia corrected. So with this, your patient walks comfortably. Only in those cases where there's still stretching of the MCL, you add up to the constraint in those cases or do an upsliding medial condylar osteotomy. So the art is in getting the right kind of a balance for these kind of things. So, what is it? any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer because then I'll have to board my flight. Yes, yes. Thank you, Manoj. I think it was a wonderful demonstration uh, of the soft tissue release. Uh, to, to keep the ball rolling, um, uh, Manoj, uh, you you said that uh, you you prefer the external release for the subluxation, subluxating patella. Yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, what, what, just for the viewers, uh, can you explain that part? Because that is the part which is probably not so discussed in most meetings. Yeah. Initially, for a couple of years or decade or plus, I was always doing the internal releases in those cases. But the tight structures are externally, not internally. So, once you start addressing and understanding, this was a very good paper from uh, Rajesh Maniar on the three step one, step two, and step three release in those cases. Once you start realizing that the contracture of tissues lies into the outer structures, the synovial, beyond the synovial sheet, onto the vastus lateralis and those uh, tight IT bands. So unless or until you release those tight structures, again, depending, it's not a circumferential release you have to do. You have to start from the, the tibial side and start moving up. So you have to identify where is the tight band and those particular areas you have to release, maintaining the synovial soft tissue sleep. That's very right. Uh, uh, Anil, will you, will you take it over? Yeah, yeah. So, Manoj, if you have time, I'll ask you one more question. Yeah, yeah. See, because there is medial laxity and you're using a CR knee, you need a lot of lateral release. Any concern with raising the joint line with, with yes, a sir. CR knee? CR knee rather is preferable for these cases because your MCL is already lax. You need to have a PCL to give you a strong abutment. So it is around. So the only point for a PS knee is you have an option of lateralizing the femoral component, thinking we'll have a patel fold tracking, but it doesn't happen. Once you start playing with the CR knees in a big way, you start lateralizing. You give an additional ligament because your MCL, we have to remember, is always stressed out. We might say we have released, but it's all stressed out. So you need one strong medial pillar to give you a stabilized knee. So CR knees, if you can do with those systems, is definitely better than a PS knee for these valgus deformities. Only in the cases, like the second case that I showed you was a very stiff knee. Despite sort of releasing the structures, I had to release the PCL in those cases. So it's not you are married around to saving the CR knee, but in if I would arbitrate on a huge volume that I go through, 90% of the cases I am able to retain the PCL. 10% cases would do a piece, uh, PCL sacrificing me, whether a PS or a CCQ. So, Manu, no, I, I agree to... with you, Manoj. That uh, CR mean more in many of these situations is a is a better joint. Uh, another short comment, uh, Manoj, that you had shown the uh, balancing of the joint using the spacer. 
Yeah. And I think that is a very good way uh, instead of just putting the implant and seeing it. Because once you place the uh, trial implants, you do give to give rise to some kind yeah. of a restraint uh, which is in, which is inbuilt in the implant. So I think the right approach of checking the balance is using the spacer. I think uh, all of us will agree on that. Uh, yeah, Deva, you have a comment on this? In, I oh. think in the severe fixed valgus knees, uh, uh, the PS uh, CR is a uh, better option. PS is a better option because already the MCL will be not so much redundant. So in a severe sure. uh, fixed valgus knee, so severe valgus, valgus knee, maybe we can go ahead with a, a PS or CR, whatever Dr. Manoj is uh, telling the points. Uh, but in a, a non uh, is a correctable one, we can go ahead with any of the um, CR or PS, it's, uh, anything can be possible. So, Dr. Ajit, uh, your comments on this? Manoj, yeah, yeah. Uh, any, any, uh, Manoj, any uh, point in favor of doing a kinematic alignment in these needs? Uh, Vikas. <laughs> Yeah, because you're pulling my leg for a valgus knee, kinematic is not the one, it's more for a varus knee, a gross varus knee. But Deva, to point your stuff right, once you start retaining the PCL in a lot of cases, even with those FFD cases also, you can do very well balanced stuff with retaining the PCL. The only thing is you have to start playing. You cannot just do a PC CR knee in these cases, you have to do in all cases. And a lot of flexion contractures, once you start doing all those armamentarium, you realize that actually releasing the PCL is not required, though you always have those options on table. It's as I said initially, if you realize that, okay, without releasing the PCL, my knee is not getting balanced, do release the PCL. But if in a valgus knee where the MCL is always going to be stretched, you release, uh, you maintain a second pillar and the second pillar is the PCL retention, you will always have a more stable knee for a long-term future. Uh, Manoj, but just Hello. carrying on the, the discussion which uh, Krishna had initiated, the, in a valgus knee, you will avoid a virus cut for sure for TBR. Yeah. yeah. Because, Dr. Ajit, because you had a, you had a comment. Yeah, because you... Dr. Oh, Ajit. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Manoj, I have a question. Yes, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, see, one is uh, in a fixed valgus knee. I'm Dr. Deepak Inamdar from Bangalore. Yeah, Deepak. Yeah. So, one is a lateral approach for a fixed valgus knee. Mm -hmm. The second, uh, common perineal nerve palsy incidence in your cases for a fixed valgus. Because in some, pa some papers, studies have seen more than 12 degrees is an indication for a fixed valgus that they may develop a post-op palsy. Recently, I had one. So, I want uh, opinion on both of these. So the question is a fixed valgus knee and that too in high amount of flexion. Those are the cases in which we should be concerned about saving the common peroneal nerve. Also, one of the tricks in those cases is once you do a release, keep the knees in flexion with the pillows for a short amount of time and gradually stretch those knees. For me, an absolute indication for using a established lateral approach is once I have a dislocated patella or a patella which is totally fixed to the lateral gutter. Only in those cases, I would directly go with a lateral approach. Otherwise, in my hands, I would still use my workhorse, which is a medial parafetler, and release the lateral side in those cases. But nevertheless, people have been using the lateral approach for a lot of other cases also. But I personally feel that in only in the cases where you have a patella which is lying in the lateral gutter, which is totally adherent, where you do not have sufficient soft tissues on that side, are the cases where there's an absolute indication for a lateral approach. Okay, well, thank I, you. Thank you so much, Manoj. Uh, I think we'll just carry it on uh, with the uh, with Dr. Krishna Kiran showing us the uh, the epicondylar osteotomy, and that I'm sure that will be a will be addressing to some extent uh, how to avoid these uh, uh, nerve palsies in a, a fixed flexion, uh, fixed flexion and valgus deformities. Uh, Krishna, please. Thank you, sir. Thanks, uh, I will, Krishna, I will take a leave after just board the flight. And uh, best thank wishes you, for Manoj, and have a safe flight from all of Thanks, Manoj. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And then my observation safe. Sir, is my then screen? Is my screen is visible, sir. Screen yeah, is visible. It is visible. visible. Yes. yes. Very clear. Right. So, um, I think although this is a little bit out of turn, uh, I'm, I must apologize. I'm also traveling and uh, my flight is there in a while. Uh, so we, I'll be talking about uh, computer-assisted lateral partial condylar slide using a subvastus approach and a cruciate retaining knee. 
all of which are uh, considered to we be have a zoom zoom on here in this sorry uh, uh, so the uh, idea is to talk about cast assisted lateral partial condylar slide for uncorrected valgus knee uh, focusing on the technique and tips and we will also be doing these surgeries through subvastus approach and uh, using cruciate retaining knees so all these are actually no nos when we are looking at uh, conventional teaching for valgus knees and i'll give you justification for each and every step why we do what we do uh, so we all know that the type 1 is the uh, correctable valgus deformities and type 2 are the non correctable but intact mcl and in type 3 you have an mcl which is incompetent and of course you can have varying degrees of extra articular or a hto which has been uh, under uh, over corrected into valgus which can constitute the minority of cases in valgus knees now the uh, traditional teaching is to cut the bone perpendicular to the mechanical axis which will result in a trapezoidal gap which is tight laterally and lacks medially in some of the situations and this is traditionally addressed by releasing the itb the uh, lcl and the plc through pie crusting sometimes the posterolateral capsule osteophytes and also the popliteus and this typically entails a increase in the flexion gap necessitating a limited tibial cut which is perpendicular to the mechanical axis and this makes pcl secondarily tight and requires a ps or a higher constraint implant for balancing now uh, this is a conventional way of doing surgery and this is a case example of uh, uh, a cruciate retaining knee in a very severe valgus uh, deformity which we have done now the problems with a valgus knee and if you notice some of the post operative x rays are this sort of an imbalanced situation where the medial side is still lax and the lateral tightness has not been able to be balanced and if you keep on releasing the lateral side then the gap will increase so much that you will have no choice but to use a very thick insert with constraint and using these thick inserts can secondarily lead to peroneal nerve palsy and these sort of imbalances which may look innocuous to begin with do progress into more mcl stretching and we all know that uh, the valgus knees usually fail with instability while varus knees fail with aseptic loosening and this must be kept in mind while making a decision regarding the implant uh, selection during surgery and if you have any doubt it is better to use a higher constraint implant rather than committing to either a cr or a ps or uh, uh, any particular uh, type of design and these usually require hinge reconstructions it was probably a missed mcl incompetent situation which warranted a hinge reconstruction to begin with now uh, this is a case example of a 56 year old lady with uh, bilateral knee pain uh, pain and deformity and left side you can see is a type 2 valgus which is non correctable but the mcl appears to be competent because the valgus stress is not opening medially and typically this entails a, a, a situation where you take a limited tibial cut and a femoral cut perpendicular to the mechanical axis and now you have a tight uh, lateral side to contend with and these are all the uh, uh, evidence for the use of this particular technique the subvastus approach the role of cas prerequisites for cruciate retaining implant and what is the indication for lateral partial condylar slide so why do we use subvastus approach and cruciate retention suppose you have to do a, a lateral retinacular release the patellar vascularity is better preserved there is potentially early recovery and there is risk of inadequate exposure for lateral release and malalignment uh, with the subvastus approach per se but when you combine it with cas and the use of a partial lateral condylar osteotomy you avoid the need for any of these particular situations the cruciate retention is possible when you are able to balance the knee and there is no residual medial laxity but if you have medial laxity then a varus valgus constraint or in some situations a hinged uh, replacement may be a better option the retention of lcl and popliteus are prerequisites to avoid late instability because of over release and this is a bone conserving uh op option uh, when especially when we are looking to do a partial lateral condylar osteotomy in the small indian bones where you cut a box and then you cut the condyle then sometimes the condyle will fracture but if you do a cr or a deep dish type of insert then doing a lateral condylar osteotomy is an easier option and lesser risk of condylar fracture is there now this case example which we showed uh, this is the navigation pictures of course we do now have the 
robotics and most of you would agree with me that the problem is more in extension than inflection and although lateral condylar hypoplasia inflection has been described in the literature we have also seen an occasional case where there is a hyperplasia of the lateral condyle into a central tibial defect and this must be kept in mind and we must not uh, blindly go with increasing the external rotation or decreasing it uh, but tailor it as per the individual situation now you can see here uh, when we are making a plan the limited tibial cut about 3 millimeters at uh, perpendicular to the mechanical axis and since we are doing a CR we are taking a 7 degree posterior slope and an external rotation of 5 degrees for deemed appropriate for this patient and after you do the trial reduction the residual valgus and I emphasize here that it is essential to have some sort of a technological measure interoperatively before we commit to these sort of procedures because otherwise it, everything will become a blind uh, issue. So once we did an osteophyte removal, posterolateral capsule release and ITB release from the Gurdy's tubercle, still there was residual 6 to 7 degrees of valgus deformity. And at, is, at this stage, we will commit to a lateral epicondylar osteotomy. And this is how you do it. You take a part of the condyle, not just the epicondyle, and this makes fixation easy. So one third of the condyle or one fourth of the condyle is cut with a saw and it's a relatively simple procedure. And the moment you cut the thing the deformity gets completely corrected and you now distalize the fragment and posteriorize it to correct both the extension and flexion gaps and provisionally fix it in that position and then once your uh, uh, trial reduction now shows a good position the overhanging distal and posterior parts of the condyle are now trimmed uh, using either a, a ronger or a, a bone cutting instrument and this is fixed to the uh, remaining bone with a large surface area for fixation and this will give us and you can see here the subvastus approach and the nice patellar tracking which is seen. Of course, there are situations where there is a patellar maltracking which is there pre-existent, pre-surgery. These will require uh, some sort of an outside-in type of lateral release which was elegantly demonstrated by Dr. Manoj. And this is the post-operative picture showing a uh, full correction of this deformity and that's the x-ray showing the uh, correction of the deformity with the two screws in place and there is no change in the rehab protocol for these patients where we allow them full weight bearing without the use of any brace. Another case example with a fixed val valgus deformity, again computer assisted, the use of a thin uh, polyethylene insert about 9 or 11 millimeter in these complex cases with the retention of bone for uh, the future revision surgery. So the take home message is that subvastus approach is an option in these cases, because it facilitates faster rehab, patellar tracking and preserves patellar vascularity. CAS gives us accuracy and quantification of the deformity and the use of a lateral condylar osteotomy instead of doing an individualized soft tissue release of these multiple structures make the operation more predictable and allows us to use less constrained implants with reasonable long-term outcomes. Thank you. Thanks, Krishna. Thank you, Krishna. Uh, Dr. Anil, uh, would you like yeah. to take it forward? Yeah, yeah. So, Krishna, can we ask you a few questions before before you board the flight? Sure, sir. No problem. So, because, see, the lateral femoral condyle is quite often hypoplastic. Have you ever landed in fracture of that part which you have uh, osteotomized of the, the sliding osteotomy? Any, any intraoperative fracture you encountered because they might be uh, osteoporotic or thin? The distal part of the condyle is hypoplastic. And sometimes the posterior part. But the uh, if you look at mediolaterally, the cortex is actually quite hibernated because the patient is load-bearing on these uh, conditions. So, And since you are doing a cruciate retaining design with the uh, osteotomy which involves about one-fourth to one-third of the condyle, we have not encountered any non-union or any sort of a fracture of this condyle in our practice. Yeah, but if you, one more thing yes, also, Krishna, that... Uh... Uh, this bone is quite uh, quite thick, sclerosed, the lateral correct. condyle. Correct, correct. So That's the right. fracture is relatively uncommon. Uncommon. The only situation when it can fracture is if you cut a very big box in a female patient with a very small sized femur and now you take another part of the condyle off, then you are in a trouble because sometimes the remaining condyle can just uh, fracture. So that is one of the reasons why we developed the technique in conjunction with a cruciate retaining or a ultra congruent type of insert rather than a box and a cam post mechanism. That is the idea. 
Dr. Ajit has a question. Yes, Ajit, you have yeah. a question, please. Krishna, yeah. very neat technique, uh, very nicely shown. Uh, generally, what we or when we would uh, probably, or at least I would probably do a osteotomy is uh, when I've done all the releases and found that in spite of all that, there's a residual deformity, that's when I do it. So uh, you would say that doing this uh, first uh, sort of prevents or minimizes the extent of releases that you need? Absolutely. So we don't do any release at all. So the only release I would do is the posterolateral capsule release and osteophytectomy and then the ITB release from the iliotibial band. And that is the release which is done because majority of the deformity is in extension. And if you had a deformity which is extending from extension into flexion, then now the LCL and the PLC comes into play. So we don't release any of the LCL and PLC as a pie crusting or anything because it is unreliable, number one, even in experienced hands. And we notice that generally we are not able to balance the medial to the lateral side in these situations. And third is you have to up the level of constraint. So if you are committing to a partial condylar osteotomy as your go-to in a non-correctable valgus, you have to do it first. It is not a salvage operation when you have already released everything and then not, that becomes a disaster because now you have already cut the thing uh, distally at the level of the joint line and now also removed it from the bone. So then you will definitely have to use a TC3 or a uh, higher constrained implant. So if you commit, you commit at the state of uh, ITB release and then you commit to the lateral condylar osteotomy or you do your pie crusting, whatever is comfortable. But if you did a pie crusting, I would be more comfortable putting a PS implant than in a CR implant in that situation. Uh, the, very right. wouldn't, it be, uh, wouldn't it be a straightforward take-home message, Krishna, that uh, uh, it's better to just go ahead and do a sliding condylar osteotomy and then just balance it out and leave it instead of uh, trying any other tricks on that knee? Absolutely. So, uh, I think this, in my hands, this is the go-to operation. It is much, much more predictable than uh, doing all these sorts of releases and then trying to compensate the residual instability we have with uh, uh, more constraint and uh, options. And you you also, I think, are similar in thought process. You would do a CR <laughs> with an osteotomy. Krishna, there is a question Krishna. for you. Krishna. Yes, sir. Krishna, Dr. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, can you speak loudly, please? Unmesh, we can't hear you. Yeah, uh, basically, is it a best option for a fixed valgus deformity to have a osteotomy straight on uh, rather than doing it at the last option? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Absolutely. So, unless you have an MCL incompetence, now that is a different ball game altogether. But if you had a type 2 valgus where it is fixed, but the MCL is competent, then the osteotomy is probably the go-to for me. But if you had an MCL deficient situation, then you are dealing a different beast. Krishna, can we ask one more question? <clears throat> There's a question for yes. you, Krishna. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, the question is, so, in what position do you fix that osteotomy fragment after your trials and... In what position of the knee? In what flexion? Uh, the osteotomy is fixed in around 30 degrees of flexion for the okay. because it's a collateral uh, ligament. But the uh, thing is that it actually doesn't need any fixation. It is so stable. That is the thing. You just fix it for your own satisfaction. A lot of the times we've noticed that the entire soft tissue sleeve is intact. So it is usually very stable and a single screw with uh, a, a ACL washer or something like that, soft tissue washer is good enough for uh, stability. But if you had a bigger fragment, then you could use two screws, but at 30 degrees of flexion. Yeah, Once I think... Cementing. One question, sir. Yeah, the tip is, is that you save the soft tissue posterior and inferior. Yes, I think yes, that's the tip. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Krishna, yes you have a question. Krishna, do you do, um, in all cases of osteotomy, you do surfaces or in normal cases where you don't do osteotomy, we do only soft tissue release, uh, surfaces will not be a better uh, uh, approach because we will not be able to have a visualization of the lateral structures. So, what is your opinion? Uh, that is true. So, uh, my go-to technique, as I told you, if, if you had a type 1 correctable valgus, anyhow, subvastus approach. If it was a type 2 valgus, which is non-correctable, we would do an osteotomy with subvastus or a mini-midvastus type of approach. And if it is a MCL deficient situation, 
then we would look at uh, a more constrained implant. So that is a straightforward thing for me. So I don't do any pike resting or any sort of LCL uh, release in my practice. Is there any other question for Dr. Krishna? Because he has to again board a flight. He has been kind enough to deliver his talk. If there is no question, thank you very much, Krishna, for sparing you, time. I would, have have I would have loved to stay back. Thank you, Krishna. Have a have a safe flight. Safe thank you, sir. Now we can request Dr. Ajit to present his his case. Yes, Anil. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Ajit, please. Yeah. He's also at the airport, I think. No, no, I'm still in the hospital. <laughs> I'll be leaving shortly. Shortly. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, bit of an unusual scenario. I was uh, sort of stumped in my uh, surgery, so to say. So, yeah. So good evening. And at, at the outset, I thank Dr. Anil and Dr. Rajiv along with the IOA as well as IA for this opportunity. So uh, quickly coming to the case, uh, this is a 66 year old lady presented uh, with years of pain and limp. Uh, and uh, at this particular point in time, she decided that she needs uh, something doing. So any quick comments on the X-ray? My thoughts were the severity of the deformity, what the status of the MCL would be what sort of releases I would need and uh, maybe the type of constraint that I would need. So these were the things running through my mind when I saw her. Any quick comments from the panel? Mrinal? I think this person. is a type type 3 valgus and yeah. probably uh, there's a defect in the tibial condyle also. Yeah. Once I've cut the tibia, um, there'll be abernated femoral condyle as well. Yeah. And uh, probably I'll need a TC3 kind of implant once I've done the releases. I would because the MCL is stressed here. Right. Anyone else for a quick comment before I proceed? Dr. Rashkumar is there. I think he has joined. Dr. Okay. Rashkumar is there. I think we can proceed. Yeah, okay. So instead of wasting time, so this yeah, is her uh, walking video. She was not using a crutch or a stick, but uh, she was hobbling around. Like so. So it looks like reasonable stability is there. It's the MCL may be intact. That's what it uh, looked like the way she is walking. That's the flexion she had, and uh, that's the on table evaluation of the uh, laxity. I thought I felt that the MCL was uh, there was a definite endpoint. So with that. And these were the thoughts, like I mentioned, the approach. My conventional approach is the same as the antromedial approach. Uh, rarely do any antrolateral approaches or the lateral approaches, so to say. And then the releases all standard, trying to uh, get both inflection and extension, trying to get that and how to manage the bone defects. That's what the thoughts were. So on table, almost a 40, 45 degree valgus there. So. On table also, it felt that the MCL was um, stable. So again, just running through what uh, uh, Dr. Mrinal also mentioned. So the thing is, once I open the knee, this is what I found. Any quick comments here? Any comment from the faculty? There's a fracture mm -hmm. there. Yeah, there is a stress fracture of the postolateral condyle. And this I was totally unprepared for and uh, I had not actually picked it up on the X-ray. So now what? With this with this uh, thing, what to do was the question. Uh, whether to uh, scrape out the uh, fractured ends, freshen it, maybe pack some cancellous bone and put a couple of screws and go ahead with the cuts or remove the whole thing and try to reconstruct. That was the dilemma that I had on table. So, Dr. Ajit, can yes, we ask sir. a question? Was yeah. it involving the lateral apicondylar area also? The no, 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 it was not. It was not. It was I'll not. show you subsequent uh, slides. It was not. It was just the postolateral inferior to the uh, uh, epicondyle. All right. Great. So what would anybody do? I mean, any quick thoughts whether to fix it in situ and do the cuts or remove the whole thing and then go for some sort of a constrained implant? 
I think Ajit, you can fix it with the temporarily with the K wires. Okay. More with the routine cuts. Okay. So that was one option. My I thought think... was to freshen it, trim it, and fix it with screws, and then go ahead with cuts. But then I was not sure where my screws would in. Uh, the fixing. My cut. The Somebody was saying something. K wire. The fixation with K wire would have an advantage. Mm -hmm. Because you can actually take the cuts and cut the K-wire which are coming in the way. way. And that would keep the fixation intact. And then later on, you can actually add the screw if you want to, if you see that the remaining <clears throat> fragment is not stable. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just run through. Um, so whether it was a sponk, it was actually, I think, a stress fracture rather than a sponk. And then the question was how to manage the defect. I was inclined to actually... Remove the whole thing and reassess and go ahead because I thought keeping it in C2 and freshening it, I may not get a good uh, 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 opposition of the raw surfaces. So, so that's the uh, defect there. That's after the tibial cut. And uh, excise that and see the amount of defect there. So, uh, the standard 8 mm uh, postrolateral um, wedge would not suffice for this. So you need to somehow build it up. That's just getting my rotations right. To make sure that I am on the anterolateral cortex so that my rotations are okay. And uh, see with the trialing there after the cuts, the distal femur needed a 4 mm wedge, but the postrolateral or the posterior lateral, even with the 8 mm, there was a huge defect. So then the uh, decided to use that same bone graft and then just placing it there, trialing it, making sure that uh, there would be enough bone for me to proceed with the definitive uh, fixation. There, that was with the um, wedge and the bone graft. I thought if I have enough bone, I would get away uh, without the wedge there. Um, so then use the bone graft that I have taken, fixed it with the small Herbert screws, and then went ahead, only a distal lateral uh, um, wedge, and the entire, that area was the bone graft that uh, I had taken out. Good tracking of the patella. And then uh, there at the, before closure, that's the immediate post-op. That's at two years. And that, is her range of movement about 90 95 degrees of flexion that she had so this was one big surprise that i had on table so i thought it would be a lesson for people young at least the youngsters to be prepared with all sorts of armamentarium when we do such severe deformities so uh, thank you uh, nice case ajit thank you uh, can i just uh... Uh, would you would you uh, would would we as a panel or as uh, people who are doing this regularly give a message out that get a CT done before a complex knee come when the complex knee to get these surprises out of the way and plan it? Yeah, if, if you find something unusual, yes, why not? <laughs> Only so, thing is suspecting it. Yeah, because X-rays in this case can be very misleading, and yeah. I wouldn't have got an X-ray done, a uh, CT done in a patient like this yeah my comfort level was the her gait she was walking quite as you could see the walking video she was quite all right and even on clinical examination the uh, uh, there wasn't any sort of uh, uh, significant pain uh, to suggest a stress fracture probably it's been there for months and uh, the pain part of it had been uh, sort of taken away by the longevity of that stress fracture I think the take home message should be we should have uh, the constraint implants with the augments. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I think type two or even more than that yeah. in the backup. That is why one need to be more careful with valgus knees as compared to virus knees. Very true, sir. You go well, very well prepared. That is very that's right. This, that's why this uh, it, webinar. Uh, a valgus knee uh, needs a much more careful planning absolutely. than a routine virus knee. Very right. It is it is it is fifty percent revision preparation. Yeah. In the primary knee. 
at least yeah. i have in for tkrs where i would ask, actually ask for an mri is where those uh, the condyle suddenly sort of collapses these are the cases which form mm. where the uh, the condyle suddenly collapses and that's where you get an mri to see to what extent that's going and how much sort of either a wedge or a, a, a sleeve or whatever you need that's when i would think of a c i mean mri but routinely i have not uh, actually got uh, other than scanograms nothing else really so great 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 learning dr ajit thank, thank you. you very thank very you, much sir. i know you have to rush to airport again to your to board so flight much. yeah today is a flight day so <laughs> now maybe request <laughs> dr rajkumar have you joined dr good rajkumar? night good night good night and have a safe journey please <clears throat> thank you sir is dr rajkumar there Dr. Rajkumar and Dr. Unmesh are together. Dr. Unmesh? I think Rajkumar was there. Yeah, he joined for a while. Shall I give him a call? He's also traveling? Or... Yeah, yeah, they are traveling together. Today is a travel day. We are in a... We are in a... Resort... So I suppose we'll get some some connectivity soon. Uh, I think he will be soon with us. So I think we are reached. So I, I'll ask him to join in a minute. I'll ask Rashma to join one minute. So we go to the next turn. In the meantime, we can have a case presentation. Dr. Rajiv is. Or we have one more talk on robotics by Dr. Chandrasekhar. Dr. Chandrasekhar, you are there? I am ready with my slide. If you guys are okay, I can pitch in. Yeah, please, please, please. Yeah, thank you. We'll utilize this time. Yeah. You're going to speak on robotics, the role of robotics. My screen is visible. No, not yet. You have to share your screen, please. Visible? Yeah, yeah please. We go to the uh, yeah, slideshow. Okay. Thank you, IOA, for this opportunity. And uh, I'll be talking on uh, uh, image-based active robots and uh, valgus knees. So alignment and survivorship, whichever alignment you do, you do the better soft tissue balancing. So much of soft tissue balancing has been discussed. Not that just because we do robots, we cannot touch the soft tissue. So species, we need to do the soft tissue. How does the robot pitch in and help us in valgus, severe valgus? I'm going to take you through. And the classification has been discussed. Grade one, less than 10 degrees and passively correctable with contracture of the lateral soft tissue and and uh, this is most of the 80% of the cases we deal with this. Grade 2 is about 10 to 20, 20 degree valgus with MCL elongated but still alive MCL. And grade 3 where the constrained implants are the need. So technology adoption is on high. 21% of the surgeries are done through robotics worldwide now. So this is the robot which I am discussing. I use an active robot called Kivis. So we do a pre-operative CT scan. Then there is a surgical planning, which is done before surgery. Then we go inside the theater. We open the joint and mark the knee. Uh, the CT points, what you have done on the pre-plan and what you mark on the patient knee gets compared. Then there is a gap check, which is done. You can either go for a modified resection or a modified gap technique. Then you ask the robot to do the milling and then you do the final gap and implant. So this is how the pre-plan is to do the hip center, knee center for the mechanical condyles for the epicondylar axis and the posterior condylar axis. You see the implant in 360 degrees matching the posterior condylar medial and lateral symmetry. You see how the implant looks in middle laterally. Basically, you shape match the femur, but this is a static plan. This doesn't mean that you cannot do any dynamic changes on the table. This is just helps in the implant positioning both on the femur and tibia, the planned result is taken on the pen drive and loaded on the robotic machine. So again, I'm reiterating, this is a static plan. You can change everything as per the soft tissue needs on the table. So these are the three parts to the robot. First is a main console, which is used to capture the knee anatomy. It's a navigation camera. Then there's a robotic milling arm and then the software planning. So these are the benefits of CT scan, which uh, 
there sometimes we, we can we can see if any surprises are there stress fractures we can see the implant position patellofemoral femoral rotation you basically know the implant sizes you can minimize your instruments in the or minimize the assistance in or virtually the surgery is done before going to the theater sagittal implant position you can flex or extend the component and then you see how the gaps changes uh, since it's an uh, ct based robot we don't do hip marking or malleolar marking sometimes can be erroneous that is an advantage in image based robot so comparison of the ct scan what you mark on the pre plan gets compared on the real time so any alignment you can do mechanical function and kinematics since you are sticking to valgus it's more to do with the mechanical alignment i don't do functional or kinematic in this and sometimes missed talus lesions can be picked up with the ct scans so these are the uh, benefits of the ct this is the marking what we do these are the femoral arrays femur and the tibia this is just the marking video how we mark the uh, uh, both the femur and tibial anatomy this is the patient which i want to discuss this was done in the morning today she has a valgus knee and as dr ajit told we can uh, also do the stress test and see before uh, we start the surgery so this is the pre operative walking this is our pre op x ray it's a valgus knee so these are the intraoperative options which are available for you and uh, which you can use it and this is the extension gap if you see now if you see the left side image so the distal cuts are 2.6 and 7 basically 7 on the medial side 2.6 on the lateral side this itself should help us in the extension medial the tightening releases because uh, there is 7 mm cut the gap opening is 3 and 10 3 and 10 basically the plastic size is about 13 and 20 tibia is planned about 5.1 and 5.8 if you see the top corner the the, the c is the femoral implant which is chosen the rotation is zero to the transepicondylar axis it's a mechanical uh, alignment varus is zero degree the component is kept at zero this is the pre plan so the limb is showing minus 5 hyper extension is a 9 degree valgus if you see the second and the third image one which is taken out with the stress 8 and 6 what was 10 and 3 has become 8 and 6 that means the extension may not require any releases because it's a correctable valgus in extension and if you see with or without stress it's it's the, both the screens are seen in the six, screen 2 and screen 3 then you see the flexion gap again with or without stress so with stress it's 13 on the medial side it says it says that your flexion medial is quite loose that means mcl is elongated the flexion lateral is 7 with or without stress not much variation if you see both the slides it's 7 and 8 and 13 on the medial side so this is gap plan is done without stress where you do the gap plan without stress and you see these are the changes i have done if you see the top corner i have shifted the implant couple of millimeter posteriorly i have internally rotated the femur to 4 that means i had kept 1.8 degree to the pca now it is about 2 degree internal rotated to the pca i have flexed the component to couple of degrees now you see the balancing now it is 10 and 10 and extension medial and flexion medial extension lateral is 5 and extension lateral is 8 if you see the bottom corner so i may or may not require release but i know flexion is taken care it was 13 and 8 i have made it to 10 and 8 this is gap planning without stress now again you see gap planning with stress if you see gap planning with the stress you see the right side picture it's extension medial 8 ex flexion medial 8 and extension lateral is 6 and flexion lateral is 5 these are all done without any cuts this is just before the cuts it's a pre plan it's a dynamic pre plan you do with stress without stress so basically i know there won't be much releases in this because extensions 8 and 6 is almost balanced out flexion is 8 and 5 let me uh, let me go ahead and see how the post operative checks are so what are the options which are available on the table so once you do the uh, uh, marking of the knee then you get to know whether your knee is extension and flexion both valgus and correctable no release are required suppose you have an extension valgus and a flexion valgus which are non correctable to stress test that means some bony adjustments you can make but everything cannot be done on the bony adjustment you may go for releases and this has been extensively now discussed by manoj and krishna with epicondylar osteotomy extension correctable with stress and flexion non correctable to stress then you can do rotation of femur that means your flexion medial is loose you can play a couple of degrees of rotation it makes a huge difference for a stressed mcl and a tired mcl internal rotation helps us to cut less bone on the flexion medial says so you avoid the releases on the lateral side you are correcting the bony uh, component extension non correctable to flexion correctable to stress it band release 
extension valgus and flexion varus some knees are extension valgus and and, and inflection varus there is no need to change in the rotation you can just balance the lateral side once all the cuts are made with it band releases if required so this is the dynamic joint balancing which helps match the bony landmarks and preoperative ct joint gaps post bony resection is calculated before bony resection adjusting the bony resection lines to obtain ideal joint gaps post operatively well balanced knees so this is the small surgery which we did today so this is how the knees are chucked it's just a bit faster video and this is how the joint is mapped first this uh, ct markings gets compared with the what you mark on the patient's knee then if there is any error of marking it shows because you are basically marking the patient's knee there is no 3d creation of the image because it's a, it's a ct based robot once all the markings are done then the the plan is already loaded on the robot you do a dynamic gap checks what i told you at 0 30 60 90 120 20, and play the bony adjustment but as i have told you just to get the mcl tight you can't internal rotate for 7 or 8 degrees couple of degrees is okay but it plays a huge role this couple of degrees tightens the uh, mcl because you don't cut uh, much on the posterior medial uh, side so it helps in avoiding the releases especially because it's very unpredictable to uh, release the popliteus and the lcl for the flexion tightness yes for extension tightness a good it band correction will do the needful if it's a fixed valgus the game is different you can do the post lateral capsule or the inside out technique as defined by ranavat so this is an active robot the cuts are done as per your prerogatives and then the plans are done pre plan then there is a dynamic gap check then there is an adjustment then the knee you see both in uh, stressed and without stress then you balance your unaffected side go ahead with the cuts finally when all the cuts are made again you see with the spacer how the implant looks both in flexion and extension at 0 30 60 90 at uh, trial implants you can see with the gap uh, balancers and then you go ahead with the proceeding of the implant so once this cut is done just pass on the video so these are just the cuts once the cuts is done then you go ahead with the final chucking so this is how the robot cuts i usually use i do all the cuts on the femur and the tibial side i use the robot only for the cut but the sizing and the rotation is mine i leave couple of millimeter of bone postro laterally for the safety this is how the gaps are checked with the gap spacers both in flexion extension yes this sometimes the power how much we use it can it's difficult to elicit so you can do a trial implant and then see this is the final gaps so the same knee which i showed so the valgus is 0 degree now the limb is at 3 degree because it is an hyper extension knee this is how i i check the gap i check the gap at 0 degree 30 60 90 if you can see the screen it is 10 9 99 9, 9, 9 so at every angle at 0 to 130 you can see you can see the stability you can see the numbers you can see the laxity so this knee basically we got out without any releases because we did only the bony corrections and this is the final cracking uh, of the same knee was so done in the morning this was uh, again after the repair this is one of the paper we presented in the indian journal of orthopedics the active robot does is quite safe it leaves a bony island whatever you have planned it cuts less than 5 mm less than what you have planned so it's safe so this is the pre and post operative x ray and uh, thank you so much and uh, we'll be happy to answer any of the questions thank you dr shankar doctor hetel any any question for dr shankar uh sir uh shankar uh, if i can you ask you I, yeah yes would you like to give one message uh, that uh, uh, which brings the robotic uh, over and above the uh, conventional surgery the one is you you have the medial and lateral laxity with and without stress number one number two imagine a situation where you have a flex medial loosening because the mcl is elongated and your extension is well balanced with the stress these are the cases where you can rotate internally femur couple of degrees and totally get away with an popliteus or an lcl release or even an epicondyl osteotomy sometimes ah, okay so, number one number, no, number sir, two you can take the mobile i'm not using it because number so practically oh, sure. what you are suggesting chanchikar is that this does reduces the amount of uh, soft tissue, tissue release, release yes 
and number two suppose there are many knees which are distally hypoplastic posteriorly not hypoplastic there are some knees which are posterior posterior lateral hypoplastic may not be distally hypoplastic so you get to know all these by doing dynamic gap changes on the table so i i personally feel the soft tissue can be less utilized as couple of degrees of bony changes a 2 to 3 degrees of mild internal rotation i mean i'm telling internal rotation to the pc a couple of degrees not to the ta this helps in so much of need for extensive releases on the lateral side both in the severe varus and valgus severe valgus knees yeah. also in the severe varus i do functional alignment where i keep my tibia to couple of degree varus which obviates the need for most of the soft tissue release in the 90% of the cases even with severe varus knees where i go for functional alignment with couple of degrees varus on the distal femur couple of degree varus on the tibia and play a little bit with the rotation and then this this is this is the game and then you don't have to do most of the times releases so in the severe varus i do functional alignment in a valgus straight away a mechanical because i can't put my tibia into varus it's already medial side is loose so obviating the need for soft tissue releases yes these couple of degrees might look very very silly but on the table it's it all, it all avoids the unnecessary soft tissue release and that's where i feel robotics or computer technologies are are definitely helpful all right yeah thank you so much any dr. other Umesh. question to dr shekhar dr umesh has joined dr uh, umesh yeah, uh, yes yes basically i use robotic as well I think that there is some network issue. Dr. Chandrakar, can you basically, unshare your screen? More is quite important. One second, then. Yes. Yeah. As, well, as he mentioned, internal rotary rotation of the femur is very important to decrease the releases, and it really gives good correction in robotics in type one and two deformities. That's what my my own uh, uh, experience with the robotics are. so that's very important to get robotics in the valgus knee and quite easy to do that thank you and dr chandrakar what percent of cases you think you have not stopped releasing earlier you were releasing the valgus knee and now with the advent of robotics and you are used with robotics type 3 valgus where you have fixed deformities everything you can't correct with one you can't have a 5 to 6 degrees internal rotation and have a patellar mal tracking yes these are very subtle and as you know sir 80% of the knees are most of the time grade 1 grade 2 grade one. Valgus knees and very less 10% 15% yes you need to be flexible as a surgeon can't be rigid and saying that i do robotics i don't release no there are very severe varus you may end up some releases on the medial side but The, the decision it obviates the need of release and you titrate the release as per the need on the table you don't you don't release because you do all the cuts and then go ahead with the release as per the need and couple of degrees of tibia varus mark my point sir it it obviates the need for a lot of soft tissue release on the medial side in a severe varus knee and you would love to do most of this valgus knee with robotics because the small rotation game what you play ultimately obviates the need of this mcl laxity once you take for example you go blindly on a conventional knee and then do a 3 degree rotation It's it's very difficult to uh, assess the flexion medial uh, looseness, and again you will end up releasing on the lateral side. Number one, yes, a smart conventional surgeon is as good as a smart robotic surgeon, according to me, because robotic surgeon robotic surgeon has the numbers on the play. A so smart... that's an important message that uh, release must be done whether uh, as per requirement. Yes, yes, as per requirement. Very right, yeah. Well, but not that every case you don't release, but you can reduce the release, and release can be taken as a last option. And once you remove all the ossified, so that that is something which is helpful on the robots. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I think Dr. Rajkumar is ready with his talk. Dr. Mm -hmm. Rajkumar has joined. Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, very clear. Sir, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we can. Very clear. Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Rajiv, and thanks, Dr. Arora, for this invitation. Sorry, I'm uh, doing through my uh, mobile phone as I'm trying. I'm using the hotspot. Internet connection is uh, very much uh, intermittent, um, but I will try to keep it as quick as possible. So, uh, come here. Can you see the screen now? Yes, please. Okay. So, yeah. 
Okay, coming to the topic straight away. So uh, that was a wonderful discussion going on among the in the balcony, and uh, almost all the points are has been covered. So I will keep it a little um, straightforward and uh, lateral parapetlar approach. How uh, to be done and how I have done for this case. So this is a forty-year-old Nile rheumatoid arthritis. So she has underwent. Uh, 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 left side at THR six years back, and then uh, right side at THR three years back, and also uh, right uh, left side total knee replacement. So this is the now the plan is for the right side total knee replacement. These are the X-rays uh, of uh, both the uh, hips uh, uh, after THR, and then left side TKR done. So if you look at this uh, X-ray, uh, the patient has got a severe valgus deformity. And uh, uh, bone is very, very soft, osteoporotic as it is expected in a valgus rheumatoid knee. The lateral compartment is badly damaged. And if you look at uh, the lateral view, you can see the joint is so uh, uh, in the lateral view, it is subluxed. The petala, spetalofemoral arthritis is very severe. It's almost stiff. And uh, in the skyline view, it is almost dislocated. It's like uh, grossly subluxated and it is any... It is not at all articulating in the correct place. So it's quite a quite a complex situation in this kind of uh, in this uh, uh, scenario. So uh, the plan is to, uh, to go ahead and do a total knee replacement. And as I uh, always do in all the complex situations, uh, 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 took a stress view. And if you see the stress view, it is partially be uh, correctable, but still. More than the partially correctable thing, the petala uh, situation, the almost a dislocated situ situation, made me to think whether to go ahead and do a, a medial parapetlar or a lateral parapetlar arthrotomy. So the uh, the, the difficult uh, points here is 40-year-old rheumatoid osteoporosis, bone loss on the lateral side, severe valgus, petala almost dislocated. So if we go ahead and do a medial parapetlar uh, arthrotomy in this situation, then definitely this patient will need a lateral uh, retinocular release to bring back the petala. There might be situations or some surgeons might be able to get away with the medial side, I, I accept, but still it will be a very, very challenging situation because a small female patient, thin individual, immunocompromised patient, if you're going to open it on both the sides, then it puts a uh, petala into a lot of jeopardy of um, vascularity soft tissue problems and uh, difficulty in getting the wound closed so in looking at all these things then i decided to go ahead with the go ahead with the lateral parapetlar approach so my uh, my algorithm for a valgus knee is almost always it is a medial parapetlar approach but if the valgus is a fixed valgus then i don't hesitate to use a lateral parapetlar approach which makes the life uh, still more easier so um, after a midline incision, this is how the knee was looking. So you can see that the petla is almost out of the trochlea and it is lying very much lateral. So in this situation, I definitely decided to go and do a lateral parapetlar approach. And this is what how the, I took the incision totally uh, going into the lateral. The key point here is in a lateral parapetlar you have to identify the petlar tendon properly and then go ahead and take the lateral uh, parapetlar approach, but make sure you are not excising the soft um, pa so fat pad and also soft tissues as we do normally in a medial parapetlar. So the moment you do and excise so much on the lateral side, then again the wound closure, the coverage of the implant becomes very difficult. So this is how slowly, gently dissect it across and then uh, go ahead. I went ahead and did the lateral parapetlar, and you can see the moment I did a lateral parapetlar approach, the petala almost went back to the uh, position. So this is how, even without pro proceeding to the procedure, the lateral arthrotomy itself corrected the petalar uh, dis uh, the dislocation. So that was the big advantage with this approach. Even though it has got its own disadvantages. But this, in this particular situation, I felt a uh, parapetlar approach uh, very, very helpful. Then after that, so you can see the petala when it was averted, completely it was excavated, such a big 
uh, depth of um, petalar excavation was there with severe osteophytes. So definitely it needs a, a petaloplasty. So af uh, after I did the petaloplasty, this is how the petala was looking. So then after that, then slowly I uh, was able to get the petala away. And this is a big challenge in a lateral parapetalar approach. Even in a fixed valgus also, whenever you uh, do the arthrotomy, it is not easy to uh, take the petala uh, entire extensor mechanism to the medial side. So that is the challenge, but you have to be gentle uh, make your way through and uh, slowly do all the releases on the uh, suprapetalar region so that you are able to retract towards the medial side. So try to do that as, as much as possible. And then the next challenge will be to get your midpoint. So that is also again in a normal situation in a medial parapetalar, it will be uh, the tibial tuberosity will be very much visible but here it is covered with the petalar tendon completely uh, uh, trying to mask your uh, uh, um, midpoint. So you have to be very careful and uh, place the uh, uh, pins correctly so that you are able to take the tibial cut properly. So the another important point to note is your saw blade has to be protected by, with, by from injuring the lateral uh, the extensor mechanism. That is, again, the next important challenge we face in doing a lateral parapetalar arthrotomy. So you have to be very careful. Once that is done, then the uh, rest of the things uh, uh, becomes a routine. So here in this situation, small female, very, very soft bone. I uh, used a small tray, 1.5 tray. And after taking the cuts, after taking uh, all the cuts, trying uh, this is the trial, the smallest femur, 1.5 femur, 1.5 tray. And you can see that without any additional releases, the petala is tracking well. So that was the big advantage of this uh, approach. If I had used a medial parapetalar approach, then I would have uh, definitely, uh, I would have opened it on the lateral side as well. So two openings in a small uh, end, uh, patient, in a rheumatoid knee, it is becomes more complex. So this is how after the implantation, after cementing the original processes, the tracking was again good without any additional releases or um, plication. So after this, the tracking was very, very good. So medial plication was done so that uh, the soft tissue heals and then the tracking becomes very good after the closure once the patient starts the uh, ROM. So that was the um, uh, medial plication. And this was the immediate post-operative x-ray. Uh, patient uh, knee brace was given, mobilized with walker. The problem started on the POD3. So this, this is again another uh, uh, problem you will encounter in a lateral parapetalar approach. You have to be gentle. So the moment uh, this happened, uh, because of the lateral, complete lateral release of the uh, lateral opening, the hematoma forms and then it puts tension on the lateral soft tissue. So that has to be uh, given sufficient time. So you have to be very careful. So in this scenario, once this was there, I had to stop all the mobilization, stop the anticoagulants, wait for some time, allow the soft tissue to heal. Antibiotics was started. Two weeks later, slowly then the uh, situation improved. The um, tension on the lateral aspect reduced and the wounds started to settle down. So this was the three weeks post-operative x-ray and then the skyline view was done. Till that first three weeks, I didn't do the skyline view. I didn't want to put stress on the pet extensor mechanism. So after three weeks, the wound started to heal and then the patient uh, went on to do well after the procedure. So the, uh, the whole uh, point here is the need for lateral parapetalar approach in a valgus knee is very, very less. Most of the time, 95% of the time, you can get away with the medial parapetalar. But these two situations, in this situation, the petala was completely dislocated. That was one situation. I did a lateral parapetalar. The next, another important situation where I go for a lateral parapetalar is a fixed valgus. Even in spite of anesthesia, if the uh, valgus knee is not correctable, even partially not correctable, then I would uh, prefer a lateral parapetalar arthrotomy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajkumar. Thank you very much. So, Thank you, Rajkumar. I think the one point that uh, you have mentioned very well is that uh, uh, there is more bleeding in the lateral parapetalar approach and that is what we should uh, 
uh, everyone should know very clearly. Uh, Rajkumar, would you agree that uh, when you need a tibial tubercle osteotomy, then a lateral parapetalar approach is rather more useful? Yes, uh, I I uh, definitely agree with that. Uh, so so that that tibial tubercle osteotomy and the lateral parapetalar approach is very helpful whenever you want to shift your quadriceps extensor mechanism more medially then that definitely it really helps but in this situation i didn't want to do that because she's already rheumatoid very thin individual osteoporotic and already the petala is dislocated so in this situation if i go ahead and do a tibial tubercle osteotomy and if it puts lot of stress on that uh, bony uh, component and if it, uh, any issue with the healing then it'll become a big problem so yeah, what that i wanted way, in to this point case, out rajkumar is that when you do a lateral uh, lateral approach lateral parapetalar approach the subluxating the patella on the medial side is more challenge and that's why we could see that you had given a long incision in this case that's very very yeah, rightly yes. shown uh, so yes. good evening. I'm Dr. Deepak Inamdar. Yes, yes please. Uh, Dr. Rajkumar, two points I would like to tell you. Mm. I recently did a similar fixed valgus. One, to prevent the wound complications, you can do a coronal Z plasty. So a coronal Z plasty of the quadriceps. Uh, not the quadriceps, the retinaculum on the lateral aspect of the patella is split. Okay. Transversely, and it's opened up. You can look okay. up about the coronal Z plasty. It's a, a lot of papers are there. So it opens out, and you can okay. stitch it side by side. As a result of which, you can cover the implant very well. I I I think I'll present it the next okay. time in this IAA. So all of you can. It's a very nice uh, approach for lateral uh, approach for all valgus knees. The second thing, instead of your uh, tibial tubercle osteotomy, which if you feel it's too complicated, I think a simple rectus snip would have been, uh, will give you a lot of adequate exposure. Hmm. I think both the suggestions are, are okay. uh, very good. Valid. So here, yeah. here quickly, quickly, I accept that, uh, that coronal Z plasty, but here I didn't have any issue on the wound closure or... Uh, uh, no, no. Uh, 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 see, you will get a, uh, you'll get a very airtight uh, closure if you do the coronal Z plasty, just like how you do in the okay. medial side. You create. No, a... That's a, that's a good point, uh, Doctor Inanda. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's a I think fantastic. One, uh, one point that we must make sure here is that there is a more bleeding anyway in a lateral approach than a than a medial approach. Doctor Anil, should we go on? Yeah, yeah. I think we should because in the interest there, of time, two more cases are there, and uh, I think Doctor Rajkumar, would you like to convey this message that after this approach? We have to go slow on rehabilitation or we go regularly the way, the way we go? Uh, very much, very much. As Dr. Rajiv said, because we are opening completely on the lateral side, it puts a lot of uh, bleeding into the completely into the subcutaneous level. So it puts a lot of tension on the soft tissue. The wound healing can be a problem. So you have to, you have to be prepared. If any need, sometimes even a plastic surgeon's help might be required. So you have to be a little careful. Go slow, stop all anticoagulants, but don't be in a hurry to do anything extra. Wait and watch. In this situation, it took uh, uh, 10 days to two weeks for the wound to settle. So thank you. it needs very patience. Very yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. And thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Can, thank can you. we request Dr. Kalia to present his case now, please? Yes, sir. I'm ready. Yeah. And Anil, uh, maybe I can take my pointers in the, in the, at the end of the webinar. Yeah. Yes, sir. You have to give us take home pointers. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes, it is. Okay, so after such an extensive discussion about uh, uh, windswept knees is something which is also an interesting case. And uh, so this is the lady. And uh, it has got a rheumatoid knee with foot deformities as well as knee and a pretty bad kind of valgus. Okay, so these are the clinical scores. VAS was pretty bad on the left side, and Oxford knee was pretty bad. Uh, this is the radiograph. And uh, here you have uh, a medial laxity, 
as well as a huge tibial defect. So you need to be careful with this because you will need to, to take care of both of them. And she's a rheumatoid with pretty bad bone quality as well. This was our pre-op planning. Uh, we do it with a digital software. And this is a long leg film of the same patient. And again, the same thing that there is a pretty huge medial laxity. So this is the kind of uh, uh, angles we measured. And uh, there's a 35 degree valgus. And despite this valgus, uh, uh, so the planning that we have here is uh, again the same thing. Uh, a lot of discussion has already happened. Uh, so which approach on the left side, uh, which implants to be arranged and how to manage the bony defects and uh, uh, when do you add a stem? So any of the, the faculty would like to, I think approach has been dealt. Yeah. yeah. Plants probably, yes. Uh, Dr. Kalia, in the interest of time, maybe okay. we just... Go okay, so fine. Then we Let's see. So these are the questions that come to your mind. And uh, so this is what we got when we opened it up. We had a massive defect on the lateral condyle. We reconstructed that with a bone graft and screws. And uh, we had a very huge medial laxity, despite having taken very small cuts. And even with the TC3, we could not manage the flexion instability because there was a huge flexion instability. And with a very large poly also, it was very unstable. So we used a hinged rotal knee and we did a posteriorly stabilized on the right side. So these are the intraoperative images, pretty straightforward. And this was how the hinge looked. And this is the post-operative radiograph. And we were we had to use a pretty large poly even after putting a hinge. So that tells the whole story that it was very, very unstable. And uh, we were talking a, a lot about tightness. Here it was like a globally unstable knee that we had after we had done very small bony sections. So the story starts after that. We were happy with that. A three weeks follow-up. Uh, there was discharge from the left knee and uh, the right knee was recovering well. And this is the situation that you have now, that you have a swelling over the left knee and there's a gaping of the wound and there's a discharge present. So uh, on examination, we find that uh, there is extensional lack and uh, to a surprise, the radiograph shows a tibial avulsion. So there is an avulsion of the patellar tendon from the tuberosity. And uh, so next, what came to our mind? Should we debride first because there's a wound problem? And do we do the repair then or we do it in a stage manner? So we decided to do it at a single setting. And uh, this was the diagnosis, patellar tendon rupture. And we did a patellar tendon repair with encirclage and wound debridement. And the improbability findings were, uh, we had a, a patellar tendon evulsion. And it was not just an evulsion. There was a huge rent in the lateral retinaculum also. And the whole of the medial capsule repair had failed. So we did a transosseous repair of the parallel tendon using non-absorbable sutures. And then we used an encirclage wiring. That was also a challenge because now we had a patella which has been replaced. And it was extremely difficult to pass a wire through the patella. So we used a wire through the superior pole of the patella, not through the bone. And the polyethylene liner was changed and antibiotic stimulant beads were inserted. So these are the intraoperative pictures. And to highlight the, the stretched out poor soft tissues, which uh, sometimes are a huge problem. And despite being very careful about it in the first instance, we still had an almost complete rupture of the whole of the extensive mechanism. Not only that, there was a rent in the lateral retinaculum as well. So that tells the whole story that how bad the soft tissue must have been. Anyhow, this was what we did. And this was the post-operative radiograph, which shows the patella in the right place and the stimulant beads. And uh, we landed up with a happy situation because now we have the patient at two months. Uh, we were very slow with the rehab. We went very slowly. And some surprisingly, we could still achieve a great result. So she is, she is walking at about two months. And, uh, and surprisingly, there is no extensive lack. So, so this is a message we want to share that sometimes complications are also there and uh, you need to very effectively take care of her complications.
so the take home message uh, from my case is uh, valgus knees in rheumatoids is not a simple cake walk there is no simple cookbook recipe be prepared and and laxity can also be a major issue one way to deal with it is take the minimum possible bony cuts and it is extremely important to take the patient into your confidence and counsel them carefully that look this is not a straightforward case and there can be many complications that you can't predict uh, infection is one of them and you need to be careful about that and even soft tissue complications and laxity and other things can happen so you need to be very careful about it thank you very much for the opportunity of sharing my case thank you dr kalia i think uh, it's a it's a very interesting case the uh, few uh, points if i can make the one is that soft tissue handling in these uh, severe valgus is very important uh, the second is that if you have a uh, rupture of the uh, of the ligamentum patelli if it is a partial rupture it usually recovers well if you have sutured uh, it well bony suture using the anchor suture or the uh, the anchor, the tendon has been fixed with the bone then the usually the results are good and you are rightly mentioning that infection is a major issue in all these cases yes thank you so much any thank question uh, uh, for dr kali uh, anil if not then maybe we move on to dr mrnal's case uh, uh, mrnal i have a i have a question for dr chandrashekar can i ask now uh, may, maybe now we can take it up after uh, uh, at the end of the webinar in the interest yeah, okay. of time no problem right thank you thank you so much yes ma'am uh, mamrinal you are on mute please Minal, uh, unmute yourself. Now, okay, sorry. Yeah. So, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Yes, we can. Visible. So, I'll be sharing a case a uh, little different from the ones which have been uh, presented. It's a valgus with extra articular deformity. Uh, it is also a rare occurrence, uh, but it can be a problem. So, this uh, seems to be a very normal looking x ray for everyone. A uh, 57 year female with, had a road traffic accident 15 years ago. Femur and tibia both were fractured and uh, she got them plated. Uh, the plates have been removed subsequently over the period of time. And she presents to me with pain in the right knee. She has a valgus thrust on walking and the parameters for infection are all normal. This is her clinical picture. So clearly she has a valgus in the right knee. And the lateral side also you don't find much of the deformity in the sagittal plane. And this is the video of her walking. You can see she can she's walking with the valgus thrust. Um, clinical assessment shows that the deformity is correctable to a small extent, but not completely. Um, these are her x-rays now. And you can see there is a malunited fracture of the femoral shaft and also a malunited fracture in the metaphyseal region of the proximal tibia with the fibula fracture also at that time. Uh, there's little bit of hyperextension uh, at the fracture site on the tibia. But if you see the femoral side, it is uh, angulated in the sagittal plane. So there is a bowing in the femur, which we will obviously need long x-rays uh, in such a case. So this, this is where the importance of orthoscanogram lies. And you can see here that she has a bowing on the lateral uh, view. If you see the orthoscanogram, she has a bigger bow on the sagittal plane of the femur as well. And what we need to assess is that she has a valgus angle uh, of almost 11 degrees. That means the femoral uh, fracture is also united in a uh, little bit of valgus that is also contributing to the increased valgus angle. And if you see that the, the anatomical or the mechanical axis of tibia is actually cutting through the condyles. So it's cutting between the condyles. Uh, according to the Wang's principle, that gives you an idea that probably you might be able to correct it intra-articularly. And the angle of uh, the tibiofemoral angle here of valgus is 20 degrees. 
So this is uh, what we need to take care of in such uh, patients with extraocular deformities. So it's a dual deformity. It's a biplanar deformity with uh, coronal and sagittal deformities both. Uh, we need to see whether we'll be able to correct it intraarticularly or you might need an extraarticular correction for which you should be prepared with the plates and also long tibial and femoral stems. Uh, some might like to do it in a two-stage. Um, Single-stage correction is also done by a few using robotics and navigation, whatever you might need to use. And you must always keep the constraint processes ready in uh, dire situations where you might not be able to balance them. So I use navigation in this patient almost done two years ago. Uh, this is the brain lens system I'm using. You can see that there is a defect in the uh, tibial condyle. And um, I've done the, um, you know, routine cuts of distal femur and prepared uh, the femur. And the tibial side, you know, uh, you can see I'm hardly cutting any bone from the lateral condyle of the proximal tibia. Uh, and just four millimeter of the bone was removed from the medial side of the uh, tibial condyle. And uh, I did the routine balances and achieved good amount of extension balance, releasing the IT band and the posterior lateral capsule. And also by releasing the LCL and pie crusting of the posterior lateral corner, I could get a flexion correction also. And these are the post-operative x-rays. So if you see this, this x-ray might look a little skewed to a lot of people. But actually, with the navigation, uh, without any corrective osteotomy done, I could get almost 0.5 degrees of, it's showing a valgus on the correction uh, um, navigation report, but it's almost like a neutral alignment. Um, it does show you the, um, the flexion in which the limb is. That's because of the, the, the bowing of the femoral uh, shaft, which is there in the sagittal. And you can only correct up to maximum of 8 to 10 degrees during the intra uh, with the with the total knee arthroplasty in an extra articular deformity in a sagittal plane. So that is an important point to remember. You can't correct beyond that because if you try and extend that, you will be having femoral notching uh, on the femoral side. And uh, you can't extend, uh, you can't re uh, reduce the slope of tibia also beyond 3 degrees. So that is also very important. So you can get maximum 4 to 5 degrees of extension in the femur and reducing the slope of tibia, you might get uh, 8 to 10 degrees of correction, not beyond that. The, beyond that, you need to do an extra articular osteotomy and then correct that. But sagittal plane deformity doesn't have much consequences on the results after total knee orthoplasty because it's in the plane of the movement. Coronal plane deformity needs to be corrected, which has been uh, almost uh, been actually, um, you know, we've reduced it back to normalcy. So if you see these x-rays in two years follow-up, and this is the video of the patient walking, and she's having a perfect result. Uh, she's from a distant place. She's not falling up, but she's been sending her x-rays and videos to me. She's doing well. So the key learning points would be that orthoscanograms are a must in such deformities where the normal x-rays would not be able to tell you about the you know deformities in both the planes. Navigation and robotics are very helpful. If you have them, must use them. The nearer the deformity to the joint, the larger the effect of the deformity on the, um, you know, uh, the nearer the, the 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 deformity is actually it has a bigger impact. Intraocular correction can be done if the coronal plane deformity is less than twenty degrees in the femur and less than thirty degrees in the tibia, and that too when the cora is located outside of the metaphysis. So that's a very important thing. If the cora is in the metaphysis, you will not be able to correct it intraarticularly. Follow the Wang's principle, which tells you that less than 30 degrees of extraarticular angulation in the tibia can be corrected with intraarticular correction of the alignment if your anatomical axis passes through the condyles of the tibia and if it is not cutting onto the attachments of the collaterals on the femoral side. Malunions more than 30 degrees are to be corrected by extraarticular osteotomy and fixation beforehand or during the surgery. Sagittal plane deformities are generally, generally better tolerated by total knee arthroplasty patients and a FFD or a flexion deformity or in the sagittal plane of less than 10 degrees or a recurvatum deformity of less than 20 degrees is amenable to correction by intraarticular correction. Any greater deformity must be corrected with an osteotomy beforehand. So that's the key learning point with this case and it's open for discussion. Uh, thank you, Manal. Uh, I think it's a very interesting case. Uh, more so because you have corrected the extra articular deformity within the joint. Now, one burning question here will be, I'm sure with, mo with most of us, 
that the uh, tibial cut in this uh, short X-ray that we see is showing as if it is in a significant virus. Uh, yeah, it, it, but yeah, obviously, it, you were doing it with the navigation and on a long film, you must have realized that it is okay. It is at... Uh, yeah, on a long film, it's it's fine, but I have, I don't have that. But on table also, we got 0.5. I have shown you the navigation report. That is all I could find uh, in the navigation report uh, with me available right now. That it's almost 0.5 degrees of valgus. Uh, so rather the tibia showing is a virus, but actually it's in, uh, you know, the alignment yeah, is in 0.5 that. degrees yeah. valgus. So that's yeah. been, uh, that was on table. So yeah. maybe it's like a kinematic alignment where the soft tissue sleeve has been balanced. Uh, in a valgus, uh, the alignment has been brought down to normal, but the implant shows in a skewed position. Even the, even if you see the femoral component, it seems like that is it's hyperextended, but that is because of there is a deformity in the sagittal plane also. But the right. patient is having a good function; she is walking well, and the alignment is right. perfectly maintained. So we'll yeah, we'll what? be happy to see the long term follow up of this patient. Uh, if the, if there is any other question, then maybe in the interest of time. I'll, uh, uh, Anil, uh, what do you say? Yeah, just one. Uh, do you have any question? <clears throat> what limit will you put to tibia virus? To what extent will you go? How many degrees? Maybe three to four degrees, not beyond that. Not beyond that. Yeah, thank you. I think, <clears throat> Dr. Ajeev, you should now <clears throat> give us the final take-home messages. So yeah, I have I'll, a I'll, I'll be pointer. quick uh, in can this. I, can because, I ask uh, a question, please? Uh, sure. Please. Yeah, th this is for Dr. Chandrasekhar. <laughs> I hope he's around. Yeah. yeah, yeah sure, sure. Now, now you can ask, please. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar, in the robotic uh, surgery about valgus knees, you were telling. Hmm. So, how many have you used the lateral approach, number one? If so, where, where do you put the trackers, number two? And what, uh, after using your uh, in, in robotic surgery, how, how much has it reduced your lateral release? So all the three, could you please answer? Fantastic question, doctor. Fantastic. It's a so, lot of questions for you, Chanshikar. <laughs> fantastic question. See, uh, the robot which I use, they have a set pathway because how the medial cuts are made, all the medial cuts and the tibia are made from anterior to posterior. The lateral cuts are made from side to side. Yes, for a lateral release, uh, lateral uh, orthotomy where... Uh, you might have to do in some fixed valgus. These robots cannot be used because you, I have to have another pathway, but we can develop that pathway where in the lateral, uh, wherever we do the lateral orthotomy, the cut has to be for that, the, the lateral cut will be anterior to posterior, the medial cut will be from the side to side. But as of now, this cut, path, cut pathway is defined for the medial parapetular orthotomy, where the anterior cut, medial cut goes from anterior to posterior, the lateral goes from side to side. So for the lateral orthotomy, yes, they can change the sequence. It's not a big uh, scientific, uh, this, but can be done, but it is an excellent thinking and an excellent question, uh, number one. Number two, the my flexion valgus releases have come down significantly because the, the dynamic balancing very clearly suggests whether your knee is also valgus in flexion or it is neutral or varus in intake. In cases where the varus, I just go ahead with two to three degrees of external rotation. If it is neutral, I can see that dynamic joint balancing with the spacers, then decide how much degree of rotation. I don't stick to three degrees, sometimes can be one, sometimes can be two, because this hypoplasia, which bears out of the distal hypoplasia, not always that they have a posterior hypoplasia. The secondary flexion valgus is because of the defect in the tibia, which mimics the secondary flexion valgus, and the val and that valgus gets obliterated once you do with the spoon or the spacer in the tibia and do a dynamic balancing. You don't have to rotate internally the flexion. So these small small things of one or two millimeters does vary a lot of difference because you when, when you start doing navigation or robotic, you'll find out that most of the valgus can be only in extension and in the flexion it is secondary valgus to the tibial defect. And once you put a space or a stress view, this valgus gets obliterated. So then you don't need to do any releases in the flexion. So yes, in fixed valgus with severe deformity, robot can't bail you out only with the bony corrections. There has to be some corrections which has to be done, which I've already 
explained so 100 100 robotic means you to your question 100 robotic valgus 80 to 90% of the time the simple knees i do, i do get away without any releases the maximum release i do an it band at the mid uh, joint level where i resect it partially or totally okay thank you so thank much you. dr shekhar thank yeah. you so much yeah yeah thank you so much yeah. So now the uh, we are already about fourteen or fifteen minutes beyond our time. So I'll be very quick uh, in uh, uh, discussing the take-home pointers. The to begin with, uh, Anil, uh, uh, I, I like to show yes, that this one case. Yes, me. Uh, I hope you can see, you can hear me and see yeah, the yeah. slides. Yeah, yeah, clear. Okay, the one case where you have a valgus knee on the left side. Uh, with a uh, patella which is subluxating and this patient was operated uh, uh, elsewhere uh, by this implant and the uh, in the interest of time i'll just quickly mention that what are the things that we uh, uh, we found out we realized that are uh, uh, little uh, not correct here is that virus cut in a valgus knee is probably a absolutely no no because if you do a virus cut you will have to release a lot of uh, a lot on the lateral side uh, which is not right and also the rotation of the femur is very important because if you have a uh, rotation of the femur that's what you see the patella is almost subluxating uh, even in post operative skyline view and there is a attrition of the uh, patellar bone uh, because it is hitting the lateral edge of the femoral component and the other thing is that this patient is almost having a partial rupture of the quadriceps and that's what is seen by this uh, dimple that he, she has and it is very difficult for her to correct to 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 extend the knee from flex position so probably these are the simple things which we can we can look after in the right way uh, and then Uh, we see we have already discussed that which classification to be followed. Uh, the we must decide whether the deformity is intraarticular or extraarticular. If there is a wear only of the bone or the cartilage, just the soft tissue release and an unconstrained implant is enough. If you have a severe contracture on the lateral and posterolateral side, then these are the cases where you need to have. the semi constrained implant with you or you be ready for a lateral epicondylar osteotomy in these cases where you have a elongated mcl there you have to be more prepared and be sure that you have a hinge ready with you and when you have a extra articular deformity as uh, uh, it has been shown by pranal probably it is right to to be prepared with the extension stem and a constrained implant which approach we have discussed very clearly <laughs> dr rajkumar had shown the lateral approach mostly the medial anteromedial approach is is enough if you have a lateral approach then you have a problem of subluxating the patella on the on the medial side and these are the cases where you can do a rectus uh, snip probably is a better way when you are doing the release you must make sure that the popliteus is is retained and if you if it is uh, very important maybe that you just release the popliteo fibular ligament the lateral uh, pie crusting or just the, the pithing with a needle or a small blade probably it is very important and use the uh, laminar spreader for this situation care is to be taken that lateral collateral ligament is not like a mcl a large Uh, bend. It is better to be very careful while you are releasing. If you are doing the epicondylar osteotomy, then do not release and just do the epicondylar osteotomy because the first you release and then you decide to go for the epicondylar osteotomy is not a right way. The some of the uh, simple cases what you see if you are seeing that correction is happening on the table under anesthesia, these patients they they need mostly no release. When you have a fixed valgus deformity like this. as we have we have seen uh, under the uh, navigation or robotic it is probably easier to do the uh, use the uh, unconstrained implant without having too much of the release of the 
soft tissues. That's what you see these patients, and that's what you see the patients follow up at a, a long follow up of five years or plus. The, the patients who have a fixed valgus deformities, post traumatic, having a lot of stiffness, probably these are the cases which are difficult. They need more release, they need more care. And that is what you can you can see that you can do it with the with the principles that we have been discussing today. If you follow all those principles, it is possible. Valgus deformity with the extension laxity are, are another another uh, difficult situation. There you have to follow the principles that you make the femoral cut the distal femoral cut less and follow the right principles, and then you can have a good result as what you see here, a long follow. -up. When you have a uh, subluxating uh, joint, very stiff knee, probably it is very important to have a constrained implant ready with you in these cases because these are the cases where you have to be preoperatively prepared to have the all kinds of uh, hinge knee, these constrained implants and the extension stems, etc. When you have extra articular deformities, when you have a fixed valgus deformities, uh, sorry, the, when you have a fixed valgus deformities, Epicondylar osteotomy, as has been shown earlier, is a very easy way. And you have a large chunk of the epicondylar, epicondylar osteotomy, then fixing it up is very easy. And it, it gives a very reliable result in most of the cases. When you have a uh, ectoarticular deformities, what you see, the hypercorrected um, high table osteotomy, these are the cases where you can do the simple metaphyseal osteotomy, fix it with a, a small staple and have a good correction in these cases in a very simple way. Just pro, you have to protect the uh, knee, knee implant, uh, knee for a short time. When you have a, a fixed valgus, long standing subluxating patella, probably these are the difficult cases. You have to have a, a constrained implant with you ready for all these cases and also be ready for the epicondylar osteotomy, which is a far, far easier and better bailout option. In this case, what you see is, a, is a, you have a uh, epicondylar osteotomy, you can uh, release the lateral collateral ligaments, lateral structures, and fix it up where, where it is best suited in that particular case. And that's what you see this patient, they follow up, and you can see that this patient is having a, a reasonable correction Leaving some amount of valgus in my practice has been a very easy way. The important pointers at the end of this webinar are you must have a pre meticulous preoperative planning, required constraint of the implants, must be kept in readiness, a study on under and overcorrected uh, genovalgum, slight undercorrection will reduce the need of the release and provide better stability and function. And secondary stabilizers must be must be preserved. Where you do the epicondylar osteotomy, probably it is better to save the bone stock. You use the uh, CR knees because you will not have to remove the box. I think these pointers, if we follow, and the discussion that we have had, wonderful discussions, I'm sure that the valgus knee will be an easy uh, case to deal with with our with our all uh, senior and uh, junior colleagues. Thank you so much, Anil. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Thanks a lot. I think it's time to now wind up the session. We are already oh, we are overshot by 25 minutes. All right. So thanks to whole faculty who, despite their constraint, participated. Many of them were traveling, and we could have more discussion. But so, for the benefit of time now, I think uh, we now call yes. it. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Anil. I think very well, well done. Again. Very good discussion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we could see Ajit also from the airport. Uh, thank you very much, faculty. Thank you. Uh, Deva. Thank you. Thank you uh, Dheeraj. Uh, Mr. Minal. Uh, Ajit, thank you so much, Anil, for a wonderfully yeah, thank convened you. webinar. Thank you. Thanks so much. We'll, we'll close it now. Yeah. Thank, so thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Ajit. Thank you, Ajit. Good, good night, everybody. Thank, thank you. Good thank night. you. Good night. Good night. Making all the efforts. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Anil and Dr. Rajiv. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Dr. Good night. Anil. Have a safe flight to those who are flying. Yeah, have a safe journey. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.